Sometimes, help comes from where you don't expect it at all. Hello my dear viewer, thank you for looking at my channel. I am sure that there are much, much more good and honest people in the world than cheaters. In this story, the main character receives a letter from a mysterious stranger, in which he learns that his wife, with whom he has lived for ten years, is unfaithful to him. He decides to conduct his own investigation and find out the whole truth. Let's hear this story. And while you're watching this video, my dear viewer, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Well, let's go. Sitting on the porch of my cozy maple tree house, I listen to the soft sounds of a guitar, creating a peaceful melody. The familiar weight of the instrument in my hands brought a smile to my face, and I enjoyed the comfort it gave me. This city, with its charming tree-lined streets and hospitable society, has always been my refuge. When I started playing a new tune, my heart was filled with gratitude for the life I had created here. Suddenly a familiar voice called out, Jimmy, there you are. Laura's voice came from the house. I looked up and saw my wife standing in the doorway, her perfectly styled blonde hair and immaculate outfit in stark contrast to my casual appearance. I thought we agreed that you would help me plan the summer festival today, she said firmly. I reluctantly put down my guitar and got up from my seat. I'm sorry, dear, I was caught up in a new song idea, I explained. Laura's expression hardened slightly. I understand, but this festival is very important for my career, Jimmy. I need your help to make it a success. This could lead to exciting new opportunities. I bent down and kissed her gently on the forehead. I know you can do it, and I'm so proud of you, I whispered. Let's start making plans. We sat down at the kitchen table, surrounded by Laura's neatly arranged folders and bright sticky notes. I couldn't help but notice how she frowned slightly. It's been happening more and more lately. So, what's our first step? I asked, trying to keep my voice cheerful. Laura's face lit up with delight as she enthusiastically shared her idea. I thought, she began, we could turn the town square into a mini carnival. We will have food stalls, games, and a main stage for performances, and that's where you'll come in handy. I nodded in agreement, imagining a holiday. It sounds fantastic. The band and I can make a set list so that everyone will dance all night, I suggested. Laura smiled, although there was a hint of uncertainty in her expression. That's exactly what I hope. Your music always decorates the show at such events. The next hour was spent discussing the details, from the placement of suppliers to the logistics of the schedule. While Laura was enthusiastically sharing her ideas, my thoughts began to drift. I admired her passion for event planning, but there was a hint of concern in her voice. Jimmy, are you even listening? Laura's sharp tone brought me back to reality. Of course I'm listening, I replied quickly. Laura closed the folder and sighed, thinking about how to organize a group to optimally attract the public. She couldn't help but wonder if her bandmates were as interested in success as she was. This festival could be a big breakthrough for them, a chance to succeed and maybe even move to a larger city with more opportunities. Her stomach clenched at the thought. Laura, we've discussed this before, she said. Maplewood is a place where we belong to ourselves. Everyone here is like one family. Why would we leave all this behind? There's a whole world out there, Jimmy, Laura exclaimed, excitement in her voice. Haven't you ever thought about what it would be like to perform in front of a large audience? To make your name known? I reached out and gently took her hand. I'm happy with what I have, dear. The size of the crowd doesn't matter to me. The love I feel here is no less pleasant. Besides... We have everything we need right here in Maplewood. Laura took her hand away and stood up. Maybe that's enough for you, she said with a note of disappointment. I couldn't shake the feeling that something more was waiting for us. When Laura left the room, I felt the distance between us growing. My love for her was unshakable, but her aspirations seemed to be leading her down a path that I wasn't sure I wanted to follow. The day flew by unnoticed band rehearsals, and a short visit to my friend Sam Carter. 
As the sun went down, I headed for the town hall, carrying a guitar case in my hands. For many years, I have been playing music regularly at the weekly city council meetings. This tradition began when Franklin Marsh, Laura's father, first asked me to enliven the proceedings. As I approached the building, I noticed Franklin talking to a mysterious stranger. The man was tall, impeccably dressed, and his charming smile seemed insincere. Franklin noticed me and invited me to join them. As always, right on schedule. Let me introduce you to Nick Harding, a new guy in town who is going to open a business here. I shifted the guitar case to my other hand and held out my hand to greet Nick. His handshake was firm, almost too firm. Welcome to Maplewood, Nick. What kind of business are you thinking about? Nick's smile widened even more. Yes, a little bit about everything. I prefer to keep my options open. I've heard a lot of good things about you, Jimmy. The shining star of the city, isn't it? I thought I heard concern in his tone, but I quickly brushed it off with a laugh. I'm here to play my music and hopefully bring joy to people, I replied. Franklin patted me on the shoulder. And you're good at it, son. Now go and tune in. We'll start soon. When I entered the town hall, there was a lingering sense of change in the air. Nick Harding's presence in Maplewood seemed to stir something, like a small pebble causing ripples in a calm pond. I didn't know that these ripples were on the verge of turning into powerful waves that could absorb everything I cherished. The kitchen was flooded with the warm light of the morning sun while I was trying to handle the coffee maker. Laura left for a meeting about the upcoming summer festival, and an eerie silence reigned in the house. Still feeling the effects of a night on stage with a rusty nail, I yawned wearily. While waiting for the coffee to brew, I decided to check my email. Opening the front door, I almost tripped over a small envelope lying on the guest mat. There was no stamp or return address on it, just my name in an unfamiliar handwriting. Curious, I returned to the kitchen and tore open the envelope, finding a single sheet of paper inside. The message was brief, but it made my heart race. Your wife keeps secrets. Be vigilant before it's too late. I reread the words once more, feeling a sense of unease creep over me. What was that? Who could have sent me such a mysterious and disturbing message? The sound of the coffee maker brought me out of my reverie. After pouring a cup, I barely noticed the taste, thinking about the note in front of me. Laura and I have been having some problems lately, but the idea that she was keeping secrets from me didn't make sense. I needed a second opinion, someone to help me figure it all out. Maggie was the first one that came to my mind. I quickly grabbed the phone and dialed her number. Jimmy, what's happening? It's not even noon yet. Maggie's sleepy voice answered me. I'm sorry I woke you up, Mags. I apologized. Hi, can I meet you at Dottie's Diner in an hour? I need to show you something important, I said on the phone. There was a silence before the other person spoke. Are you all right? You seem a little shaken up. I sighed. I'm not sure. I'll explain everything when I see you. Okay, I'll be there. But you have pancakes, they replied with a hint of humor. I smiled tightly. Agreed. An hour later, I settled into a booth at Dottie's, greeted by the soothing aroma of coffee and bacon. Maggie joined me a few minutes later. Her curly hair was even more unkempt than usual. Okay, spit it out, she said, sitting down in front of me. What got you so excited? I handed her the note and watched as her eyes widened in shock. Damn it, Jimmy, where did this come from? She asked. I found it on the doorstep this morning. I have no idea who left it, I replied. Maggie studied the note carefully and then turned back to me. And you have no idea what it might be about? I shook my head. None at all. Lately, Laura has been acting somewhat detached constantly mentioning her desire to move to a larger city. I can't get rid of the feeling that she's hiding something. Did you notice any peculiarities of her behavior? Any changes in her daily routine or new acquaintances? After thinking about it for a while, I remembered that she began to leave the house more often in the evenings, citing work responsibilities such as meeting with potential customers and suppliers for her events. 
Maggie raised an eyebrow skeptically and asked if I was sure it was true. Without hesitation, I assured her that I believed Laura's explanation. As soon as these words left my lips, a feeling of insecurity arose in me. I was wondering if something could be going on. I mean, why doesn't she act weird? Jimmy, I'm not saying that anything suspicious is definitely going on here, but given this note and Laura's recent behavior, it would be wise not to let your guard down. I ran my hand through my hair, feeling frustrated. What exactly are you hinting at? That I should keep a close eye on my own wife? Maggie leaned closer, her tone quieter. Not necessarily to spy, but just to be more observant. Have you noticed that lately she has been especially careful with her phone? Does he stay at work more often? You never know such little things. The waitress interrupted us by bringing food to the table. As we ate, I couldn't stop thinking about what Maggie had said. The thought of doubting Laura haunted me, but I couldn't ignore the nagging suspicion that something was wrong. I pushed the half-eaten pancakes away from me and said, there's something else. Do you remember that guy I mentioned earlier? Nick Harding? New to the city, huh? What's the matter with him? I've been noticing him a lot lately. He shows up at the grocery store, in the park, and even at the city hall. It's like he's always there. And I can't figure out what exactly, but something about him doesn't suit me. The way he looks at people, it's like he's analyzing them. And just the other day, I swear I saw him chatting with Laura outside her office. Maggie's eyes narrowed. Did you ask her about it? I shook my head. I didn't mean to sound paranoid, Maggie. I said softly, holding out my hand to her. You're not paranoid. You're worried. And after receiving this note, I think your concern is justified. Why don't we do a little investigation? Let's try to find out more about this nickname. I hesitated, torn between trusting Laura and nagging doubts. In the end, I agreed. Okay, but let's do it discreetly. No accusations, no confrontations, just an observation. Agreed? Maggie's eyes flashed with determination as she nodded. Agreed. Operation Open Eyes has officially begun. As we left the diner, I was overcome by a feeling of foreboding. Life in Maplewood was going to get a lot more complicated. The following days passed in a blur. Rehearsals, concerts, and my growing paranoia. I despised myself for it. Watching Laura closely, I couldn't help but notice her late-night phone calls and the way she abruptly closed her laptop when I entered the room. Meanwhile, Maggie, as promised, was diligently watching Nick Harding. She discovered that he was staying at the luxury Pinewood Inn Hotel on the outskirts of the city, which contradicted his claims that he was just passing by. The tension reached a peak on Tuesday evening when Laura mentioned a late-night meeting with a potential client for the summer festival. There was something in her voice, a slight tremor that I hadn't noticed before, and it made me uneasy. As soon as Laura left the house, I called Maggie. I think something's going on today, I said, pacing back and forth in our living room. Laura just left for a meeting, but she doesn't look at ease. Where did she go? Maggie asked, her voice strained. She didn't say, but I have a feeling, I replied. Can you meet me at the Pinewood Hotel in 20 minutes? I'll be there in 15 minutes, Maggie replied. The trip to the hotel seemed to me the longest in my life. Every traffic light seemed like an eternity, every slow driver a personal insult. When I pulled into the parking lot, my knuckles were white with tension. Maggie was already there, leaning against her battered Volkswagen. You've been waiting a long time, she said, trying to laugh it off, but it didn't work out. Her car is here, she said, nodding toward Laura's elegant sedan parked at the entrance. And guess who decided to show up? Maggie and I turned around and saw that an elegant sports car had pulled up to Laura's car. Nick Harding got out of the car, straightening his tie and heading for the hotel entrance. Maggie swore under her breath, Jimmy, maybe we should leave. But I was already there, and without hesitation headed for the building. Maggie followed me, whispering warnings that I either ignored or didn't hear. When we entered the lobby, we found it empty, except for a bored receptionist. I approached the counter with a forced smile. 
Good evening. I'm looking for my wife, Laura Marshall. She mentioned that she has a meeting here today. The receptionist was typing on the computer. I'm sorry, sir, but we don't have any conference rooms available for today. My heart sank. What about Nick Harding? Is he staying here? She hesitated, torn between the privacy of the guest and my pleading eyes. Sir, I'm sorry, but I can't divulge information about the guests, I said softly, leaning over. It's important. I think my wife could get into trouble. My insistence seemed to resonate with her, and she quickly looked around before whispering, Room 237. Without thinking, I headed for the elevator, and Maggie followed me. When the doors closed, she called out, Jimmy, please think about what you're doing. But my mind was clouded by a mixture of anger, fear, and betrayal that consumed me. The elevator doors opened on the second floor, and I rushed to room 237 at the end of the corridor. Muffled voices came from inside, Maggie pleading for the last time, Jimmy, are you sure about this? Our eyes met, and I saw my pain reflected in her eyes. Without saying a word, I turned and kicked at the door, breaking the lock with a bang. When I stumbled into the room, I was confronted with a sight much worse than I could have imagined. My wife, Laura, whom I had loved for more than ten years, was lying in the sheets with Nick Harding. They both looked up, startled by my sudden appearance. Laura's face turned pale. She was panting, desperately trying to cover herself with my name. She kept saying, Oh my God, Jimmy, this can't be happening. Please listen, Jimmy. But her words were drowned out by the roar in my ears. Nick's smug expression caught my attention as he casually sat down and began to sing, well, well, it looks like the golden boy of the city is not as perfect as everyone thought. He can't even satisfy his own wife. Something inside me snapped at his words. With a surge of rage, I rushed at Nick and punched him in the jaw. We fell to the floor, exchanging punches, while Laura screamed at us to stop. Maggie tried to pull me away from Laura, who was sobbing, but all I could focus on was the pleasant crunch of my knuckles on Nick's face. Finally... After some efforts by Maggie and the hotel security guard, they managed to separate us. Standing there, panting, with split lips and bloody knuckles, Laura reached out to me, but I recoiled, ordering her not to touch me. I announced that we were done and turned to Nick with a growl, warning him to be on his guard because it wasn't over yet. Running out of the room, I ignored Laura's pleas and Maggie's worried calls and made it to my truck before the adrenaline wore off and I started shaking and throwing up. Sitting in the car and looking at my bloody hands on the steering wheel, I felt something harden inside me. Jimmy Marshall, who had entered this hotel with trust, optimism, and perhaps naivety, was now a distant memory. In his place stood a man absorbed in thoughts of revenge. When I started the engine, revenge plans were already spinning in my head. Laura and Nick were unaware of the storm brewing on them, but soon they would experience the wrath of a man who had nothing left to lose. As I drove away from the hotel, leaving behind the broken remnants of my marriage, I made a silent promise to myself. They would both pay for what they had done, and Maplewood would never be the same again. The morning after the confrontation at the hotel, I woke up on Maggie's couch with a throbbing headache and a heart full of rage. The events of the previous night flashed through my mind, and every memory fueled the flames of my rage. Maggie emerged from her bedroom looking as heavy as I did. How are you holding up, Jimmy? I sat up, wincing at the pain in my bruised knuckles. There have been better days. Do you have any coffee? Maggie nodded and walked towards the kitchen. I followed her into a chair at a small table. Well, Jimmy, she said, putting a steaming mug in front of me. What are the plans? I took a sip and felt the bitter liquid sharpen my attention. I'm going to destroy them, Mags. Both of them. Maggie's eyes widened in concern. Jimmy, I totally understand that you're hurting, but... I interrupted her. They insulted me. They made me a laughingstock in front of the whole city. I won't let them get away with it. She sighed, running a hand through her tangled hair. Okay, I understand everything, but...
But how do you plan to do this? A grim smile played on my face. I have a few ideas, but first I need to consult with Sam. An hour later, I was sitting across from Sam Carter in his patrol car parked behind the Maplewood police station. Sam's expression was a mixture of shock and sympathy. Talking about the events of the previous night, my friend Sam couldn't believe what had happened. God, Jimmy, he exclaimed. I can't believe Laura would do this to you. And with this cunning scoundrel holding... I nodded silently, clenching my jaw. Well, yes, believe me. I need your help now, Sam, to find dirt on hoarding. Can you find anything? Sam hesitated, reminding me that he couldn't access the police archives for personal revenge. Come on, Sam, I pleaded. We've been friends since kindergarten. I'm not asking you to break the law. It will only soften it a little for me. After some thought, Sam sighed and agreed to help. But he warned me not to do anything stupid. I forced a smile and promised him that I wouldn't. But as the days passed, I began to put my plan into action, starting with small whispered conversations and pointed questions. I ran into Laura's best friend, Rebecca Johnson, at the grocery store. Hi, Rebecca, I called, trying to keep my voice steady. How's Laura doing? I heard that she talks a lot with the new guy in town, Nick, right? Rebecca looked puzzled. What do you mean, Jimmy? I thought she was working late on the festival plans. I shrugged, pretending I didn't know anything. Oh, I must have made a mistake. I just thought I saw them together a couple of times. At that moment, I could almost feel Rebecca's mind spinning pondering the seed of doubt I had just planted. Later, during a performance at the Rusty Nail, I took the opportunity to talk to Nick. When I approached him at the bar during a break, my bandmates were anxiously watching from afar. Nick, I greeted him, patting him hard on the shoulder which made him flinch. I was looking for you. He turned to face me, his expression a stoic mask of indifference. How can I help you? I whispered leaning towards Nick. Why don't you tell me about how you lived in Millbrook? I've heard some intriguing stories about your affairs there. Nick's calmness faltered for a moment. Fear flickered in his eyes before he regained control of himself. I have no idea what you're talking about, Marshall. Please excuse me. He tried to leave, but I grabbed his arm tightly. Oh, I believe you know. And believe me, we're just feeling the surface. I will make sure that every person in this city knows about your true nature, Nick declared, pulling his hand away forcefully, and his expression betrayed his disappointment. You're treading on dangerous ground, Jimmy. I advise you to proceed with caution. I just grinned back, an icy smile that didn't reach my eyes. The game has started, Nick. Let the games begin. In the days that followed, the consequences of my actions became apparent. Rumors followed Nick wherever he went, a clear sign that my plan had begun to take effect. Laura's attempts to organize the festival were often met with silence, and even her own father, Franklin, cast suspicious glances at Nick during city council meetings. Despite this, I knew that I needed more evidence to expose their deception. And then Sam came to the rescue. During an inconspicuous meeting in the park, he handed me a bulky manila envelope, his expression was serious. Jimmy, are you sure about this? Once you reveal this truth, there will be no turning back. There was no way back. I held the envelope, feeling its weight in my hands. I was sure, Sam. They have made a decision. Now they will have to face the consequences. When I left with the envelope that said about Nick and Laura's fall, I felt a combination of anticipation and anxiety. The old Jimmy would have hesitated, doubted the morality of his actions. But that Jimmy is no more. He was replaced by the one who broke down the door of the hotel room. The new Jimmy was different. He was ready for battle, and Maplewood was on the verge of chaos. A week after receiving the mysterious envelope from Sam, I found myself at Franklin Marsh's office at City Hall. My hand hovered over the doorknob, Uncertainty creeping in for the first time since this whole ordeal began. Franklin has always been a father to me. The thought that I would destroy his world by learning the truth about his daughter made my stomach turn. But I pulled myself together and knocked on the door. 
Come in, Franklin's voice rang out. When I entered the office, I saw Franklin at his desk, surrounded by papers and city relics. His face brightened at the sight of me, and then sank as the reality of the situation dawned on him. Jimmy, my boy, he said, standing up to greet me. I'm glad you're here. Please have a seat. I sat down opposite him, and the weight of the envelope in my jacket pocket constantly reminded me of the difficult conversation ahead. Franklin's eyes, filled with worry, sank back into the chair. Jimmy, he began softly. I know that things haven't been easy lately. Laura herself informed me about, well, about what happened at the hotel. I felt my jaw tighten. Did she tell you everything, Franklin? About her affair with Nick? About how long it lasted? Franklin grimaced. She's told me enough. I'm not here to justify her actions. What she did was wrong. Unforgivable, even. I broke off the conversation. My voice sounded tougher than I expected. But she's still my daughter, Franklin said, looking at me with pleading eyes. And you're still the man I've always thought of as a son. I really wanted and hoped that we would be able to find a way to solve this problem. For the sake of the family. And then I laughed bitterly. Families? She threw it away the moment she made the decision to cheat on me. And Nick? He's fooling our whole city. Franklin bent down and looked serious. What do you mean, Jimmy? Tell me. What have you learned about Nick? I took a deep breath and put the envelope on Franklin's desk. It contains everything you need to know, I said. Bank records, police reports, testimony from his past victims. Nick Harding is a fraud, Franklin. He has deceived people in other cities before. Franklin's face turned white as he looked through the documents. Oh my God, he muttered. What about Laura? Does she know about this? I shook my head. I don't think so. But she's not innocent of all this, Franklin. She chose to deceive me, to deceive everyone. Franklin's eyes reflected a mixture of sadness and determination. You're absolutely right, Jimmy. We have to stop him. We will change everything. And what do you intend to do with this information? My voice was unwavering. I'm going to expose both of them, Nick, for his atrocities and Laura for her involvement. Our city deserves to know the truth. All this time, Franklin was silent, studying the documents in front of him. After a moment, he looked up and met mine, an expression of resolute agreement on his face. You are absolutely right. The truth must be known, he agreed, taking a deep breath. How can I help you? I was relieved to feel his support. For now... Let's keep this between us. I'm still collecting evidence and building a case. When it's the right time for a public appearance, I'll let you know, I instructed. Rising from his chair and walking around the table, Franklin nodded in understanding. He put a reassuring hand on my shoulder and squeezed it tightly, showing his solidarity. I feel the need to apologize to you. I am truly sorry that Laura did this to you and that I did not understand earlier what was going on. You deserved better treatment. When Franklin expressed his understanding, I felt a lump in my throat. His words meant a lot to me. When I left his office, I was overwhelmed with many emotions. Sadness for the family I had lost, anger at the betrayal, but also a newfound determination thanks to Franklin's support. As I left City Hall, I felt like I had made progress on my mission to destroy Laura and Nick. But the feeling of foreboding did not leave me and I could not get rid of the feeling that the worst was yet to come. The upcoming battle promised to be more intense than anything Maplewood had experienced before. The next day, I joined Maggie at the Maplewood Public Library, where we delved into Nick's past in search of new evidence that he was wrong. Maggie was already sitting at a table at the back of the library, ready to reveal the truth. Surrounded by stacks of newspapers and a laptop, she turned around when I approached, her eyes shining with admiration. Jimmy, you won't be able to believe what I've discovered, she said in a low voice. I settled into the chair opposite her, looking forward to her opening. What's the matter? I asked. Maggie turned her laptop toward me, opening a news article from a small-town newspaper. It said, 
a local businessman disappeared with the investor's money. That's Nick, I exclaimed, pointing to the blurry photo that accompanied the article. But it says his name is Nathan Harper. In response, Maggie nodded understandingly. Exactly. I think we are only getting closer to solving his fraudulent game. He changes his name in every city. A surge of confidence swept over me. That's great, Mags. But we need more. We have to build a reliable proof. She smiled confidently. I'm already working on it. I have a friend, Detective Harris. He is already retired, but he still has connections. I was thinking that he could help us figure out the case. Maggie assured me of his trustworthiness with unwavering confidence. To her, he was like a family member, like an uncle. She had already brought him up to date, and he was looking forward to our arrival at his residence. An hour later, we found ourselves in Detective Harris's cluttered home office, decorated with crime scene photos and newspaper clippings from his years in law enforcement. Harris, a grumpy man in his sixties with a stunning shock of gray hair, leaned back in his creaking chair. He asked us curiously about our suspicions about a possible serial fraudster. We presented our evidence, including the documents we received from Sam, the articles Maggie found, and my own observations of Nick's questionable behavior. After listening to us carefully, Harris took notes as we talked. At the end of our conversation, he expressed his disbelief with a low whistle. Well, damn me. But to catch the culprit, we need more evidence. How do we get them? I asked. Harris paused, stroking his chin. Let's start by tracking his aliases. Let's make a list of all the names he used and turn to his past victims to see if they are ready to testify, he suggested. With my eyes full of determination, I volunteered to help in the search. Harris nodded approvingly. Jimmy, your job is to keep an eye on Nick in Maplewood. Document everything he does and everyone he communicates with, he instructed. I felt motivated again and was eager to contribute. Consider it done, I replied. As for Laura, the question arose as to whether it was worth informing her of our findings. Harris shook his head emphatically, making it clear that the time had not yet come. We cannot act yet. If Laura is involved in some way, we must act carefully so as not to reveal our intentions. Our first priority now is to gather enough evidence before taking any drastic action. After several hours of discussion, we finally approved our plan. When we left Harris's house, the sun was already starting to set, turning the city of Maplewood into a golden light. As we walked to our cars, Maggie voiced her concern. Jimmy, are you sure about this? If we commit ourselves, there will be no turning back. We have no way back. Things can get confusing, she said, making me think about her words. Jimmy from the past may have hesitated, looking for a peaceful solution, but that version of me is long gone. I'm sure, Mags, I replied, my tone unwavering. They have made their choice, and now they have to face the consequences. Maggie nodded, concern and determination in her eyes. Okay, we will put these people in jail, she said. When I returned home that evening, my mind was preoccupied with strategies and possible consequences. We were on the verge of a revelation that could shake Maplewood to the core. And although a part of me felt a surge of excitement, a quieter voice, eerily similar to the old Jimmy, whispered a warning reminder. Am I ready for the consequences? To the pain that would inevitably follow, not only for Laura and Nick, but for all those who trusted them in the city. I put aside these doubts. It was too late for doubts. The decision has been made. The plans have been put into action. Now all that remained was to observe the result. As I drove up to my entrance, I felt anxiety engulf me. Maplewood seemed to be on the verge of something irreversible, and it seemed to me that I had the power in my hands to overturn it. The city square was bursting with energy. Residents gathered for a seemingly ordinary meeting. I froze on the periphery, watching with a pounding heart as familiar faces took their places, unaware of the coming changes. Her face showed concern. Are you ready for this, Jimmy? She asked softly. I nodded, determination showing in the way I clenched my jaw. 
as much as I'm ready at all. I asked, is Detective Harris here? Maggie confirmed, he just arrived. He's preparing everything for the presentation. I looked around the room, noticing Nick in the foreground with his usual arrogant grin. Laura was sitting a few rows behind him and looked worried. All right, Franklin's voice rang out across the square. Let's get started. Today we have to solve several unforeseen issues. The chatter died down when Franklin's gaze met mine. Nodding in approval, I plucked up the courage and headed for the exit, realizing that I was being closely watched. Thank you, Franklin, I began, grabbing the microphone. I am sure you are all interested in learning about the purpose of this meeting. We recently received information that concerns every resident of Maplewood. It's time for everyone to know the truth. Nick's smile faltered, making Laura squirm in her seat. We've been looking into the Nick Harding case for the last few weeks, I said. Unfortunately, what we have found is disturbing. Detective Harris got up and pressed a button to start a slideshow. Newspaper clippings, police reports, and bank statements appeared on the screen, showing the evidence we had gathered. A skillful imposter deceived people in different cities, extorting money from them. The crowd reacted with shock and whispers. In a sudden burst of emotion, Nick stood up, his face flushed with rage. This is absurd! You can't just accuse someone without proof! Detective Harris stood up confidently. Oh, we have proof, Mr. Harding, or should I say Mr. Harper, or maybe Mr. Daniels? You had quite a few aliases, didn't you? The detective began presenting the evidence one by one. As he spoke, I watched the reactions of the people in the room. Shock turned to anger, and betrayal was visible on every face. Rebecca Johnson, Laura's friend, stood up. Is that true, Nick? Did you cheat on all of us? Nick's facade collapsed. I have no idea what you're talking about. It's all a misunderstanding, he stuttered. But his protests were ignored as the crowd began to turn against him, their voices filled with anger and disbelief. Franklin took a step forward with an expression of anger on his face and said, Nick Harding or whatever alias you're hiding under, it's time for you to leave Maplewood. You're not welcome here anymore. The crowd burst into cheers when Nick, realizing that he had lost, began to retreat. No sooner had he disappeared than Sam Carter appeared with two other officers. Just a minute, Nick, Sam said, pulling out a pair of handcuffs. You are under arrest for fraud and embezzlement. While Nick was being led away, the attention of the crowd turned to me. I could feel their curiosity, their burning questions about how I had revealed the truth. Jimmy, someone exclaimed. How did you unravel all this? Taking a deep breath, I prepared to tell the most difficult part of the story. It all started with a note, I began, a warning that someone close to me is hiding something. I noticed Laura stiffen, her eyes widened in fear. That note made me realize that Nick wasn't just cheating on the city, I continued. He was also involved in an affair with my wife, Laura. All eyes turned to Laura, who seemed to be cowering in her seat. Laura... Rebecca's voice trembled with disbelief. Is this really true? Laura rose to her feet with a smooth movement. Her complexion faded. I didn't know about Nick's story, she stammered. I assure you, I was unaware of his treachery. But Maggie intervened in a stern tone. But you knew you were cheating on Jimmy. You knew that you were deceiving him and the whole society. The atmosphere in the crowd changed again. Now her disapproval was directed at Laura. I watched her confront the anger and disappointment of others with a mixture of approval and sadness. While the meeting was in chaos and the voices were questioning and accusing, I felt a comforting hand on my shoulder. It was Franklin. You did the right thing, son, he said softly. It wasn't easy, but Maplewood has earned the right to know the truth. I nodded in agreement watching Laura run away from the square with tears in her eyes. What's going to happen now? I asked. Franklin sighed. Now we are recovering. We are healing. And we will make sure that nothing like this ever happens to our city again. Looking around at the crowd of familiar faces, now overflowing with a variety of emotions, 
I realized that this was just the beginning. Maplewood will never be the same, and neither will I. The courtroom was crowded, all the seats were occupied, people lined up along the walls. I was sitting in the front row, Maggie on one side, and Franklin on the other. Nick, once confident, was now nervous at the defendant's table. When the bailiff called the court to order, I leaned over to Maggie. Do you really think Mary Thompson will actually show up? I asked, doubt creeping into my voice. Maggie nodded confidently, assuring me that Detective Harris had confirmed her willingness to testify. It seemed like she was waiting for this moment to finally deal with Nick after all these years. When the trial began, the prosecutor carefully outlined the case against Nick. My attention was reeling, and my head was buzzing with anticipation of what was about to happen. We kept Mary Thompson's involvement a secret, hoping to catch Nick off guard. Suddenly, the doors of the courtroom swung open, and all eyes turned to the figure that suddenly appeared. With determination on her face, a woman in her thirties confidently entered the room. Nick's reaction was instantaneous. The color disappeared from his face when he turned to face her. Your Honor, the prosecutor began, the state would like to call an unexpected witness, Mary Thompson. Nick's lawyer quickly stood up, objecting to the unexpected revelation. I protest. We were not informed about this witness, he protested. The judge looked at his glasses and made a decision. The protest has been rejected, but proceed with caution, counselor. I will keep a close eye on this. Mary stood in front of the court, not taking her eyes off Nick. The prosecutor asked her a question. Miss Thompson, could you tell the court about your relationship with the defendant? There was clarity and strength in Mary's voice as she answered, I was not only Nick's business partner, but also his accomplice in criminal activity. The courtroom was shocked and did not believe in her revelations. Nick's lawyer quickly rose to object, citing her admission of misconduct. The judge intervened, addressing Mary directly. Miss Thompson, did you know that your words today could be used against you in a future lawsuit? Mary nodded decisively, stating, I am ready to accept the consequences of my actions, but the truth must be revealed. As Mary talked about their illegal operations spanning several states and the victims they were using for their own purposes, Nick's calmness was shaken. The facade of indifference collapsed when Mary revealed the extent of their deception and manipulation. When asked why she decided to speak out now, Mary's answer rang out in the silence of the courtroom demanding justice and responsibility. The prosecutor's question hung in the air. Mary's gaze briefly shifted to me, and there was a flicker of hope in her eyes. Finally, someone challenged Nick. Someone had the courage to reveal his dark secrets and reveal his true identity. I realized that it was time to stand up for what was right, no matter what it took. Despite Nick's lawyer's attempts to undermine Mary's testimony during cross-examination, her story remained firm and unwavering. When Mary stepped off the podium, she met my gaze, and we both felt a sense of satisfaction and relief. At that moment, I saw Nick's facade crumbling, defeat reflected on his face. The jury didn't waste any time making a decision. When the foreman announced the verdict, Maggie's hand squeezed mine tightly guilty on all counts. The courtroom burst into applause, a mixture of delight and disbelief in the air. When Nick was led away in handcuffs, a feeling of emptiness settled in me. The victory was bittersweet, a reminder of the darkness that lurked beneath the surface. Turning to Franklin, I realized that the battle might have been won, but the war was far from over. Not really, Jimmy, he said. I nodded in agreement realizing that there was one more task left to complete. The truth about Nick was revealed, but Laura's betrayal remained a mystery to most residents of the city. It's time to bring her to the surface. The atmosphere in the old Maplewood Theater was tense. All the seats were occupied and people crowded along the walls, gathered, in their opinion, for a simple charity concert. They didn't know what was waiting for them yet. The city had been gripped by a dramatic saga for months, and now they were on the verge of witnessing its denouement. 
Backstage, I was clutching my guitar, trying to calm my nerves. Maggie came up to me, concern on her face. Are you sure about this, Jimmy? She asked. Once you take this step, there will be no turning back. I nodded firmly, my resolve unshakable. I'm sure. It's time to reveal the truth, whatever the consequences. With determination, I went on stage, greeted by a chorus of applause from the audience. Familiar faces flashed around me, friends, neighbors, people I grew up with. Scanning the crowd, my gaze landed on Laura, who was sitting in the third row. Our eyes met briefly, and I noticed fear in her expression. The music continued to play, calming my nerves as I performed a few songs. But when the last notes of Maplewood Night faded away, I realized that the moment had come. I called you here for another reason. There is something important that you all should know about. As the crowd quieted down, curiosity flashed in their eyes. You are all familiar with Nick Harding and the crimes he committed in our city. But that's not all. Nick didn't act alone. I noticed Laura stiffen in her chair, her eyes wide with fear. For several months, Nick had been having an affair with someone from our community. This person betrayed not only me, but all of us. And this woman is my wife, Laura, I announced, startling the audience. All eyes immediately turned to Laura, who seemed to want to disappear into her chair. In the stunned silence, my voice rang out. I think it's time for you to tell everyone the truth, Laura. Reluctantly, Laura stood up, her face losing color. Jimmy, please, she begged. Don't do this. I challenged her. What should I do, Laura? Shouldn't this city know the truth? Taking a deep, shuddering breath, Laura prepared to speak. It really is. I admit that I had a relationship with Nick. I want to clarify that I did not know about his criminal activities. Nevertheless, I deeply regret betraying Jimmy and all of you. I apologize for what I did. There was a mixture of emotions in the theater. Our friends and neighbors reacted to what was happening with shock, anger, and disappointment. I have recognized the seriousness of the situation and will try to explain the situation. I was as surprised as all of you. It is very important that we all find out the truth together. We often underestimate how easy it is to be misled, even by those we trust the most. Standing up from the front row, Franklin agreed with my comment. Despite the chaos, his authoritative voice broke through the tension. Recognizing that we have all experienced betrayal, Franklin has given us a choice. We can let him divide us, or we can unite and become stronger. As Franklin spoke, I noticed a change in the crowd. The anger began to dissipate. In a moment of shared vulnerability and shared resilience, Laura, with tears cascading down her cheeks, began to make her way to the exit. As she passed me, she stopped and whispered, I'm really sorry, Jimmy. I just nodded back, unable to find the words to express my emotions. When she left the theater, I felt a sense of relief sweep over me. The burden of truth was revealed, regardless of the outcome. The rest of the evening passed in a blur. People came up to me to comfort and express solidarity. The residents of Maplewood came together and told their stories of betrayal and forgiveness. During all this, I was overcome by a deep sense of unity with the city like never before. When the crowd dispersed, Maggie came up to me and asked, What should we do now? I couldn't help but smile, a real smile that hadn't been there for months. Now, I replied, we are recovering, we are healing, and we will make sure that Maplewood comes out of this situation stronger than ever. With that, I picked up the guitar and started playing. The familiar chords of Heart of Maplewood filled the air, and I began to sing. Soon others joined them, their voices merging in perfect harmony. At that moment, I felt a unity and strength that cannot be destroyed. Despite the shadows of deception that threatened our city, the light of truth and community prevailed. Maplewood faced difficulties, but we came out of them stronger and more united than ever. When the last notes died down, I looked around the crowd, seeing not just strangers, but friends and neighbors. I believed wholeheartedly that Maplewood's greatest days were yet to come, and my family shared that opinion. 
One day when I was sitting on the porch playing the guitar, I saw Franklin coming towards me. He looked older and more unusual than ever before. Jimmy, he said, sitting down next to me, I have something important to tell you. I felt the seriousness of his words when I put the guitar aside. What is it, Franklin? I asked, bracing myself for what he was going to tell me. Taking a deep breath, Franklin began to speak. The note that started it all came from me. I was speechless looking at him. You? But why? Franklin's eyes reflected a mixture of sadness and determination. I've noticed all the signs, Jimmy. I could tell that Laura was unhappy that she was drifting away. When I saw her with Nick, I couldn't just stand by and watch you get betrayed. You deserve to know the truth. I leaned back in my chair, trying to make sense of this revelation. I put my hand on Franklin's shoulder and thanked him in a low tone for the courage with which he did what was necessary, even when it was difficult. Franklin confirmed my words with a nod, a sense of relief reflected on his face. Sitting together in a quiet company and watching the sun sink below the Maplewood horizon, I felt calm. The road ahead might not be smooth, but I was reassured that with friends like Franklin and a resilient community like Maplewood, we would be able to overcome any obstacles that stood in our way. When the shadows cleared, a new dawn dawned for all of us. After the divorce, Laura left Maplewood. Maggie and I declared ourselves a couple and we were comfortable together. We dreamed of a big family, which Laura did not want. Three years later, Maggie gave birth to twins, whom I adored as much as their mother. Franklin and I often spent our evenings drinking beer to the sound of a guitar, and on one of those days, he told that his daughter Laura got married. But the marriage did not bring her happiness. Her husband turned out to be a true la villas. He often did not spend the night at home. Laura's life was complete chaos. At night, she cried into her pillow, realizing how abruptly her life had changed. Once she betrayed the man who loved her, and now the man she loves is betraying her. And that's the end of the story. Thank you for your valuable time. Another story that serves as a great example that it is better to be an honest and faithful spouse than a lying cheater. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, my dear viewer, if you haven't already done so. May the power be with you.